Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hey, wildlings. Have you ever noticed people will tell you to deal with your own business? Now that phrase can easily be misconstrued as an admonition to only deal with what pertains to you yourself. I'm sure when some folks use it, they mean it this way, but I personally like to think that it pertains more to finishing what you start. We've seen from several stories read on this channel that the past will catch up to you and it will punish you for not seeing things through. And again, we'll see that in tonight's continuation of Butcher Face. This is part four if you're interested. By Dash 32. Sorry for the long absence. I'll try to fit that explanation into the story. The first few paragraphs here may admittedly be a little boring, but it catches you up to where we've been and will show you a little of what's to come. Like the last parts of the story, this will also be long. Not long after we'd found out that Chris's brother, Evan, had made multiple copies of the Butcher Face tapes, things actually slowed down for us, but they didn't stop. Chris's father and brother still claimed to have strange occurrences happen to them. They seemed to see shadows in their backyard and have the general feeling of being watched. Evan also claimed to get strange phone calls at work. Sometimes when he answered, he'd just hear breathing. Another time when the phone rang, as soon as he answered it, he heard a loud banging like whoever was on the other end was slamming the phone against the table. This led to Chris's father placing his hunting rifle near the front door and buying new locks for all the doors and windows. They didn't seem to help. I wasn't there to witness this, but a little over a month later the family had gone out to run some errands. When they pulled into the driveway, they were disturbed to find something hanging on a rope in front of the front door from a beam protruding out of the wall just under the roof. As they cautiously got out of the car, they realized what it was. Hanging from the rope was a deer, dead from a gunshot. The rope was tied around the antlers, with its back legs dangling about a foot off the ground. They squeezed by the carcass and went into the front door. Chris's father instantly reached for the rifle that was supposed to have been sitting right next to the door, but it wasn't there. They walked deeper into the house, through the kitchen and into the dining room, and that's when they found the rifle sitting on the kitchen room table. When Chris's father picked it up, he could smell the gunpowder, indicating that it was recently fired. He opened it and found a round missing. The deer had been killed by his hunting rifle. I visited soon after, and I could feel the tension in the house and was shown a few pictures that they'd taken of the deer. I was told the story and noticed the members of the family constantly looking at Chris while telling it. After Chris had admitted to being secretly obsessed with Butcher Face for those four years, it was obvious that the family had grown, well, grown detached from it. I began to visit more often around this time because I could tell he needed some cheering up. At one point, I asked him why he thought that Butcher Face left his media around in the first place. His answer was, maybe he wants to tell his story. I asked, what's his story? That he's a dick-burning, eight-fingered psychopath? But I became more and more accustomed to sitting awkwardly off to the side while a fight about some insignificant topic was going on. I also started noticing that Chris's girlfriend was visiting less and less. It all came to a head when she finally broke up with him. We were sitting in his room in the basement when he said he wanted to get away from all of the drama and claimed to know a guy who had recently inherited some houses from his recently deceased father and was trying to get some tenants. Since he'd been a longtime family friend, Chris said that he hoped he could get one at a lower price and asked me if I wanted to be his roommate. Well, being 25 and still living with my family, I immediately jumped at the chance. Fast forward through the whole search and process, 
we picked a small bungalow in a less populated end of town close to his family. It was pretty small. It was uncomfortably small, actually. But it was what we needed and something that we could actually afford. We ultimately had no complaints. Well, that's not entirely true. When we went down to the basement to check it out, we found that the last tenants had left it full of garbage. Boxes of varying sizes, old cans of paint, buckets full of junk, and sheets of plastic interspersed with beer bottles and cans. We basically just said, ah, oh, screw this, we'll deal with it later, and then ran back up the stairs. We began haggling the price and decided that uh, the price of the house would be reduced if Chris agreed to fix up the land of our house and most of the other houses that the landlord owned. Even though only Chris agreed to this, I assured him that I would help out with that too. We decided that it shouldn't be too hard and we'd be able to do it on weekends. We began moving in a couple days later. Uh, the next few weeks were pretty boring. We picked our rooms, which were basically on opposite ends of the house. We had only one extra bedroom and I put my sword collection and some other stuff in there. I'm admittedly almost a hoarder. <laughs> we had decided to stay away from technology for a while. We'd obviously use phones and occasionally the television, but we rarely used the computer about this time, especially anything that could be used to make any kind of extra media. Around this time, Chris had picked up a bag of stuff that he left at his ex-girlfriend's house. Shortly after he returned, she called asking him if he accidentally put her camera in his bag. He looked through it, but didn't find anything. We'd had some free time since we were looking for new jobs in the area, so we decided to do some exploring of the neighborhood to get a better understanding of the layout of the area. One thing that we noticed, though it didn't really interest us at the time, was that while driving around town and turning around a corner down the road from our new house, there was an unused dirt road that turned off into the woods. There was an unused dirt road that turned off into the woods and went back in the direction of our house. We eventually ended up at a restaurant in the center of town. We sat next to the bar. We sat at the bar and ordered some food and drinks. And while waiting, I noticed that the girl sitting next to me was doodling a smiley face smoking a cigarette on her napkin. She eventually stopped and turned back to speak to the girl next to her. I still don't know why I did this, but I quickly grabbed the napkin and added a crown, bunny ears, a bulbous nose, and some stubby arms and legs to the smiley face. She caught me sliding it back to where she had had it and laughed at my additions to her drawing. We began talking back and forth, and she said that, well, she'd show me around town. She reminded me of the actress Emma Stone with black hair, so I'll just call her Emma. A little while into this whole thing, uh, Chris got a call from his brother, Evan. Apparently, Evan had been leaving work earlier in the day, and on his walk to his car, he saw something propped up on the steering wheel. Getting into the car, which was still locked, he realized what was on the steering wheel was a DVD box. He brought it home, and it took only a few seconds of watching for him to realize what it was. One of those DVD copies of the Butcher Face tapes that he had made in college almost five years ago. We wanted to keep our minds off of Butcher Face, so we just continued what we were doing over the next week. Uh, we looked for jobs, I saw Emma a couple more times, we finished unpacking our stuff, and, you know, we did a little bit more local exploring. This time, we wanted to go looking around the woods behind our house. We used to play in those woods a lot when we were younger. We basically started walking in a straight line from our house into the woods. I don't remember how long we'd been walking but we eventually came across an old dirt road cutting through the woods. 
we determined that it was the old road that we had noticed earlier in the week. If we'd turned left, we would have ended up back at the same spot, so we decided to turn right and follow it deeper into the woods. After another half hour or so of walking, we came across an old, dilapidated building. It resembled an old church, but it had no religious paraphernalia in it. It seemed to be some sort of old meeting place for the town. Uh, the door was already open. I wanted to check it out, but Chris pulled me back and said, Don't you remember the last couple of times when we went into an old unused building? I admittedly found this a little funny, so I talked him into coming in with me just for a look. It was pretty interesting. We looked around a little bit, noticed a section of the ceiling over the second floor that had collapsed, revealing a great view of the sky. We checked out the basement and found an old horse-drawn carriage. After a little while of looking around, we just decided to leave. A few days later, we got a call from Chris's ex, and she said she wanted to see us. Later that night, she came over to the house, and we could instantly tell that she was agitated. She caught us up on how her camera wound up missing earlier that week. She usually kept it in her desk, but it wasn't there when she went looking for it the same night that Chris had picked up his stuff. That's why she called us that day, wondering if he had taken it. She then found it in its drawer again the night before she called us. She then pulled the camera out of her purse and said, and this is what I found on it. Turning it on, she showed us the first picture, which was of her sleeping in her bed. She was sound asleep in the picture, in her room, in the dark. There were two more pictures of her in bed, each from a different angle. The flash wasn't on, but there was just enough light to make her out. The next one was of her car, sitting in her driveway, most likely taken on the same night. Another was looking through the window of a house. It was of a woman sitting at a kitchen counter watching television. The next picture was of a small building sitting on the side of an otherwise empty road. A sign at the edge of the road with a large red apple on it with the writing too blurry to read. Chris pointed at the sign and said he knew that place. Uh, it's supposed to sell apple themed goods like pie and cider. She continued scrolling through the pictures. The next one was an extreme angle of the side of an old house. The pictures then after that all took place in and around that house and showed us something that shocked us. That set of pictures showed people in the house that seemed to know Butcher Face. The first picture of one of them had a little person. He was very short, bald, and was wearing a gray suit and tie. He also appeared to be an albino with white skin and red irises. The shot was also a close-up. He was sitting on what looked like a shelf on a wall close to the floor, looking into the camera, appearing to be laughing hysterically. He had a resemblance to a thinner version of Vern Troyer. We eventually gave him the name The Creeper. Uh, the next person shown was a girl wearing a pink dress. We couldn't tell her age because she was wearing a crudely made paper mache mask, the kind that had a piece of string tied behind her head. I'd still say from her size that she was probably in her late teens to mid twenties. The mask had very simple features. It was just two holes for her eyes and a slight bump where her nose would be. She was simply sitting in a chair with her hands on her lap, looking into the camera. Chris's ex came up with the name False Face for her. In the same picture of False Face, the silhouette of another person could be seen in the shadows behind her. It was too dark to see this person, but they appeared to be wearing a suit and tie as well. One picture showed a very thin man wearing a vest with a bald head and his back to the camera. His arms and hands were completely and chaotically covered with tattoos. There were so many of them that we couldn't pick out a single design. His whole body could have been covered with them for all we knew because more tattoos could be seen coming out of the vest going up his neck to the back of his head. They looked like uh, vines or lightning bolts. The other pictures then seemed to go back to the more uh, classic butcher face style 
A picture of an arm with a hand missing the ring finger and pinky with a deep cut on the back of the forearm. An axe jutting out from the front of an old green reclining chair sitting in a room with the corner of the ceiling collapsed in the background. A cat standing on the tall bookcase hissing. A few pictures of what appeared to be animal skins hanging in a cellar with rock walls and a dirt floor. There was only one picture of the backyard containing a tree branch that appeared to have been hacked at with the jagged fibers of the wood from the tree jutting into the shot. We noticed a very large barn in the background of this photo. The next few pictures had the people sitting at a dinner table. Falseface was now wearing a different mask that resembled an anime character with a large smile and a white wig. The man with the tattoos couldn't be seen, but the albino little person was sitting at one end of the table. It was covered with plates of food like Thanksgiving dinner. Any spaces on the table not occupied by a plate were covered in small, lit candles. Uh, the person sitting at the end of the table never seemed to get into any of the shots, but we believe that it was the same person in the background of the picture of False Face. The only thing that we ever saw of him was a hand with a gold watch at the bottom of one of the dinner shots. One of the last pictures was a shot of a mirror. The flash was too bright and obscured the photographer's reflection, though. The last couple of pictures were of Chris's ex sleeping in her bed again. After calming her down, being freaked out about somebody taking pictures of her sleeping with her own camera, we called Jesse, who was with us in the cabin at the end of part three, and asked him to come over because he's the only other person we knew that had experienced this kind of media. We'd only seen him once or twice since that night in the cabin, and it had been months since the last time we hung out. He'd been living in the nearest major city. Uh, he's an artist, a sculptor, and oddly enough, a tattoo artist. While we waited for him to drive the hour and a half to our place, we went over the photos on our camera. We spent a good amount of time looking at each separate picture. We had no clue who the other people in the pictures were, either. We'd been talking about this for a while when we heard a loud screech and then a bang outside our house. We jumped up and ran outside to find Jesse's car sitting in a Y-shaped tree about five yards away from our house. He'd lost control of the car and slammed into a large boulder sitting on the side of the road. His car was then thrown into the air and landed in the tree with the front end stuck in the tree at a steep angle and the back bumper sitting on the ground. The boulder had been pushed almost a foot and the tree was now slightly leaning. We all ran over toward the car but just before getting there the driver's side door flew open and Jesse jumped out. Landing on the ground he fell to his knees and began frantically crawling away from the car. We could tell that he was freaked out about something so we instinctually grabbed his arms and dragged him away. The second we grabbed him, he started yelling, He was in my back seat! Butcher face was in my fucking back seat! Jesse finally got his footing and we all ran back to the house. Getting inside, Chris's ex called 911 while Jesse locked the door. We then ran to one of the windows and watched the car. There didn't seem to be any movement, and after a while, Chris said he wanted to go out and look. Um, Chris's ex and Jesse said no, but I agreed because this guy had been slippery in the past. We agreed to go out there only if we had weapons. Chris's ex and Jesse grabbed the biggest knives they could find from the kitchen, while Chris chose a sword from my collection. I, on the other hand, chose not to use a weapon. I decided that I wanted to get some evidence of him, so I turned the camera on my phone on, and I'd record everything. We each filed out of the doorway one by one. I stayed in the back since I didn't have a weapon. I could tell none of us wanted to really be doing this because of how slow we were moving. We must have looked ridiculous, all four of us tightly grouped together, one of us holding a sword, another holding a phone in front of him, slowly creeping toward a car in a tree. While getting to the car, I lifted my phone up and faced the camera through the driver's side back window. 
Chris then grabbed the handle and threw the door open to find it empty. But the passenger's side back door had also been opened. The cops showed up a few minutes later. They searched the car in the nearby area and found nothing. We told them that Jesse saw someone in his backseat but didn't say who because we knew that it would be too unbelievable. And it would have been a hassle to explain everything to the cops, everything that we'd already told them. When things began to calm down, I looked at Jesse's arm and noticed a new tattoo. Looking closer, I was shocked to realize it was Butcher Face's CV symbol. I angrily asked him about it, and he defensively claimed that it was his own I Survived Butcher Face badge of honor. He'd done it himself a few weeks after the cabin incident, he said. After Jesse's car was taken off the tree and the cops left, we caught Jesse up on what had been happening. When Chris's ex went to show him what she found on her camera, she couldn't find it. We went outside and looked for it, hoping that it had been dropped in the confusion directly after the accident, but no luck. We asked him if he'd been having any strange occurrences, and he claimed that he hadn't, but he had been doing a little bit of investigating, he said. Excitedly, he pulled a folder out of the bag that he had and brought up our hypothesis that we'd come up with after the cabin incident that Butcherface uses his media to draw people in and get them obsessed with his message and to become his disciples. This sort of reminded him of an operation conducted by the government called MKUltra. Now, this was a program designed for interrogation techniques and to create assassins out of regular people through psychological and physical torture, drugs, and hypnosis. He claimed Butcherface's actions were very similar, with him leaving his media, breaking into houses, killing pets and animals being psychological torture, and his media being a form of hypnosis because it was so dark and twisted that it affected people who experience it mentally. This could very well be the way that he recruits disciples. That raised the question of how people actually get obsessed with his media at all. This led to Chris's bringing up brainwashing and hypnosis. Brainwashing interested me because there's evidence of it happening in our past, like POWs and the Korean War and cults. Brainwashing is imposing a set of beliefs on somebody by using the various coercive methods of indoctrination, including destruction of the victim's prior beliefs to induce them to believe or do something. That really does seem to be what Butcher Face is doing. We also got into the topic of people being influenced by movies, television shows, and video games. I don't believe this stuff, but there are a lot of people who believe that some folks viewing violent content will themselves be violent. There are some controversial studies that sometimes give credence to it. My personal opinion is that if you view violent media and you do violent things, you're not really being influenced by it because the violent acts you commit would have happened whether you watch the media or not. If anything, you might be inspired, but you won't be driven by it. We all have that line that we won't cross, and just viewing violence won't make you do something that you wouldn't normally do. At the end of the night, we were all tired, and we decided to, you know, call it a night. Since Jesse's car was obviously wrecked, I drove him home, while Chris drove his ex home because she didn't want to drive home alone. I didn't get back until 2.30 in the morning. It's needless to say, none of us got much sleep that night. It was at this point that we realized that we'd never gotten rid of Butcher Face. He'd just shifted his priorities for a while, and finally, he'd come back to us. So kids, for a while, you may think that the past is past and that you're in the clear, moving on. But there will be times when it may not be so accommodating, just temporarily busy. So stay scary, wildlings. Always remember 
the sucker punch is coming and make the most of your nights.